welcome everybody. Um, I know everybody just wrapped up over, I, my, Mitra is joining us here now for this session. Just to give you a little context, everything has been every 30 minutes, it's like a new session. So everybody's coming right over here, coming right out of um, Albert's session. Um, he's an Oracle, works on the content side. Like before that, we had Kristen um, from Aon talking about data and then Kelly Butler was talking about um, diversity and inclusion in our language. I mean, it's just been like, it's been a whirlwind. So. Oh, everybody can breathe. And I get to introduce everybody here to my long lost friend <laughs> that I haven't seen in a really, really long time, um, Mitra. So thank you for coming. I combined oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm going to just a quick introduction. So Mitra's a, a journalist, right? So a lot of us come out of these journalism backgrounds. You're, you're still a journalist, though. I think I have straight. Yeah, um, I am. You are. And we, we first met. This has now been probably 15 years because when we met, we were both very young mothers in a newsroom that I'm just going to go ahead and say was not built for young mothers. So we very quickly found each other. <laughs> like, um, and then now our kids are older, our careers have evolved. And one of the things, you know, you and I haven't seen each other in a long time, but I think I've just been watching what you've done. You know, when you went on, you went to CNN and then now the stuff that you're doing, the entrepreneurial ventures. And I just, what did I have you come on and talk a little bit about that? Like, I want to know about URL media. Um, I want to know. I have so many questions, and this is sure. how I got you to answer them. So, yeah, why don't you jump in, introduce yourself to everybody, and then I've got I got questions. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. I'm having ever slight um, trouble seeing you, but I can see the chat. So, mm -hmm. if anything resonates, or if you have questions, like to the folks in the audience, um, please make your presence known there. Mm -hmm. I so Willie's already given me a shout out. Hello, Willie. Thank you. It's great to um, to be with you as well. Um, so um, Mary Ellen, you're absolutely right. I um, am like a, in some ways, my my path is absolutely a product of that unplanned pregnancy, which you kindly did not. Um, I had one too. Look, mine was too. Did not was share that part of it. Yeah, um, it was mine. So was mine. <laughs> And you and I, like, I feel like if you work at the Washington Post and you're a woman in your 20s, like, you're on a trajectory, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I had a plan and I got pregnant and that derailed the plan. And so in many ways, what I'm about to tell you in terms of, like, what's URL and what am I doing now is a direct mm -hmm. outcome of um, newsrooms not being necessarily equipped for people like us. Mm -hmm. um, I did have my child. I was so lucky at the Washington Post in some ways. Um, while I had to take disability pay to kind of make the six month maternity leave work and we went into massive credit card debt, um, which I don't often tell people from those years, um, in order to make it work, the paper was also owned by Don Graham, who uh, really liked me as a reporter. And so he said, you know, like, we'll do what we have to do. And so when I came back, I was part time. Um, and um, I was working like three days a week at the post while my until my daughter was two. And when she turned two, um, a friend of mine named Raju Narasetti, who at the time had been at the Wall Street Journal, I just saw this like announcement cross my email saying he was moving to New Delhi to launch a newspaper. And I just wrote to him saying, I'm so jealous. Because of course my trajectory at the Washington Post was supposed to be you know, go from the Metro desk to the national desk or the foreign desk and go overseas and have all these assignments. And I got pregnant and that's just like not the life that um, mm -hmm. is comfortable with a baby. Anyway, so that was, my, so two years later was my first taste of entrepreneurship in some ways, not the type I'm doing now, which I'll promise I'll get to, but it, it definitely um, allowed me to launch a newsroom in India and answer the question, you know, knowing what we know today about media, how can we do things differently? Mm -hmm. Which has been this recurring theme of the last 17 years or so. My daughter just turned 17 mm -hmm. she college. Um, so here's what happened. I was at CNN. I had been there for about four and a half years um, when uh, we hit the collision of the global pandemic, uh, the death of George Floyd, and um, much kind of consternation in our industry over what we were going to be to people. And, and people take that question in different mm -hmm. ways. There's some folks on Twitter, it's, are we objective? Are we, um, 
a utility play? Is it news and information? Is it serviceable? Is it solutions? Is it, you know, all the things mm -hmm. that have been questions and thorny questions in journalism forever, I think really came to a head that spring of 2020. And I was no different in really feeling it. I would say one difference might be that there was a clear awakening among my mostly white colleagues and I have always fashioned myself as trying to be on the biggest story of the newsroom, like that's mm -hmm. what I And diversity was always baked into my job, right? It was never, um, I never had diversity in my title. I was never um, a recruiter. I was never, I mean, it was just not uh, a side thing for me. It was everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so as diversity became everything for everybody, here I was for, you know, my 20 years in different newsrooms around the world, um, suddenly contending with kind of a fork in the road of, do I help everybody discovering the thing or do I carve my own path? And so at the time, CNN came to me and said, you know, what are your, what's your next contract look like? What are your next few years look like? It comes against this backdrop that's like super micro, which I feel the need to share. I live in Jackson Heights, Queens, which is um, uh, it, uh, you know, the borough in New York City of Queens, uh, one of the most diverse pockets in the world. Uh, the New York Times called us the epicenter of the epicenter, just to kind of give you a mental right. picture of how bad COVID was here. Mm -hmm. And so during those few months, while I'm dealing with kind of the existential of the journalism, who are we to people? Are we objective? Are we not objective? The CNN-ness of it, like, what are you going to do next? Like, mm -hmm. you want more people, more power, more money, right? Like, it was a pretty good life. I'm dealing with this third piece, which is really integral to your question of what, what are you doing now? Um, <laughs> but it's neighbors, cool. It's cool. It's <laughs> so neighbors were coming to my husband and me and saying, you know, we both have COVID. Um, do you know anybody who has antibodies who could babysit our children or could we leave them with somebody? Um, do you know where to get a COVID test? Does this, does, does, you know, what's the line at Patel Brothers like? Do you know where to get yeast? Um, do you know how to claim a body from the city morgue? Because we know an undocumented immigrant who's there and he doesn't have any family and you could not make this up. We looked at the picture. My husband gasped and he said, that's my mechanic who got me on the road every day when I was commuting by my bicycle to work. Um, and so that's the type of neighborhood we live in, which is very dense and vast and New York City and yet very close and overlapping and intimate and lovely. And so we were kind of uh, under assault, uh, if, if you will, by these queries. And because we've always been involved in our neighborhood, in some ways, my husband more than me, he's an artist um, and does a lot of public art projects and works with the community um, in public spaces. And then me, who's just pretty decent at navigating bureaucracy and information, we said, you know, we should do something. So we launched this newsletter called Epicenter. And I launched that while I was still at CNN because it felt so needed and it was not going to be, you know, CNN's not going to be able to help the People's Republic of Jacksonites, right? So we launched the newsletter. It takes off, but in, in, in quick order, while all these thorny issues are going on, you know, I start to realize, it's not a surprise to me, but I really start to see the limits of scale on the internet, right? You're a newsletter, like just because somebody needs diapers, like, is anybody out there hearing it? Whereas at CNN, I'm dealing with, you know, millions of people every day. And so um, I started to think about how do I continue to center my people? How do I um, feel authentic and not just to myself, but to my mm -hmm. people, to my community? But how can I be successful on the internet? Because we're dealing with, you know, SEO and Facebook's algorithms changing every day. Today you need video, tomorrow you don't. Today you post the link, today, you know, six links and they're gonna, uh, you know, devalue you and the results. Like you guys all know this, right? You, We sort of, every day we make decisions based on scale, even when we're tiny operations on the internet. And so I thought about how organizations like CNN and 
to a uh, to some extent and to a detrimental extent Fox News have been able to leverage scale and um and that yields you know everything it's everything it's money it's power it's influence um and yet they're still six weeks late on the story, right? My little dinky epicenter knows where to find yeast. You know, I know that people are about to be evicted because the moratorium's about to run out. You know, national media does the story once the furniture is on the sidewalk, right? So I can predict trends based on my micro community in a way that is actually incredibly valuable for the internet and for the rest of us writ large. So URL media was born out of that. It was also born out of um, the idea that we could scale together without sacrificing what we represent to our communities. Um, just to be super explicit, URL Media today is a network of nine black and brown media operations around the country. Uh, we share content. So, you know, um, Hurricane Ida hits New York. There's a story on basement apartments. Epicenter writes about it. The other partners can run that content. We're on Apple News together. So finally, we are starting to leverage the power of togetherness to, you know, really make a dent um, in spaces where mainstream media have, you know, really ridden um, outlets like Apple News and Facebook to, to great effect. Um, and we share uh, revenue. So we are going out there. We're hiring right now for a VP of revenue and sales. Um, and we have... Um, secured a few ad deals, but we believe in this power of the network where um, mainstream brands more than any other point I can ever remember in my life and career want to support community media, want to support black and brown brands. Some of that might be through marketing and advertising. Some of that might be through you know, their corporate social responsibility budgets. It might be from a diversity budget. Um, it, you know, it's really coming from all places. Um, I open up websites, newspapers, podcasts every day. And I see mainstream outlets riding the diversity gravy train, if you will. And a much of URL is built on, these are outlets that have been doing this work for decades. Epicenter is the youngest of them. Others are like the Haitian Times, 20 years old, WURD in Philadelphia, Black Talk radio station, almost 20 years old. Um, so really outlets that have been doing the work in their communities before this quote unquote trend, um, it is our lives and it is our mission. And so um, I was probably a longer answer um, than you needed, but that's kind of how I chose the entrepreneurial path. I um, was able to call Jeff Zucker, who's the president of CNN and say, um, I'm so grateful for everything you all have done for me. And I'm so flattered by Sent, like giving me more and more and more, but I think I'm going to lean into this dinky Queens newsletter <laughs> and try to make it work. And I have to say it's working. I mean, I pinch myself every day, but I have, we have um, for Epicenter, we have diversified revenue from grants, from um, advertising and from membership and from URL, similarly from consulting contracts, advertising, and we, um, are also very um, lucky to receive a number of grants from uh, nonprofits uh, to get this up and running. So I think, no, that wasn't long at all. That's actually, I could, I would actually, I'd like to hear the hour long version of it too. Oh. <laughs> so I think one of the things that I find really interesting is you mentioned, you know, being inside these institutions, right? And again, I was inside one of, one of it too. And it's like, you kind of work through and you, you know, the, I see you as someone who was very successful in navigating those institutions. I mean, you made it to the peak where you were one of, I would go say, well, that's CNN job. That made you one of the most powerful women in the U in U.S. traditional media. I, I won an award that said I was a powerful woman. So, so <laughs> not, not because I have an ego, but because I have a no, no, statue no. saying that's true. No, <laughs> I, yeah, I'll, I'll say it for you, but it's just like, I mean, when you think, because I think people don't realize how incredibly, as much as like, in some ways we have made progress. Um, Kelly Butler earlier was talking about how incredibly white <laughs> content marketing was. And it's like, well, that's because many content marketers come out of the journalism world yeah. and journalism yeah. hasn't really diversified very well either, right? And okay. so in your case, you are one of the, the folks, like I look at it and I see that you, not only you made it up and you also brought a lot of people up with you. So I'm just gonna go again, you're, you're not gonna say that, I can say that for you. You are always an advocate, as a young reporter, you were always an advocate for getting your stories were good. Don Graham didn't, you know, somebody take a shot on you because Brooklyn Brand, it's because you were a great reporter. Um, and what made you a great reporter was you looked past obvious sources. 
that was what made you great, right? Like you would go out and talk to people that I think other reporters might not have. Like that was something that I felt like that was always baked into your work and into your worldview. Um, and then I think as you mentored people and as you moved up in your career, I know when you went to India and went over the paper, when you came back, like you have, everyone has always said this about you, right? That you don't just, it hasn't just been about like, well, I'm the woman and I'm in charge here that you've always, mm. but I'm, I'm curious how, what made you decide to go really? I mean, you kind of described it. I want to dig into this a little more. You went from working inside the system and really working and successfully. And I think making good progress to then saying, nah, this isn't going to do it for me. <laughs> like, what really triggered that? Like, I mean, let's go back. I know you mentioned it a little bit, but I do want to go into that. Like, when did you say, fuck it, basically? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, that's, I, I think that moment is uh, significant because it's like, in some ways you could say it's like years in the making, but then you like really jump off the cliff and that's like a second, right? right? So, mm -hmm. um, I would say elements of it were years in the making. I, um, you know, I had dreams of buying, um, wow, I mean, I can say this, I had a dream of buying the New York Daily News, like, you know, Tribune bought them for a dollar. I was like, oh, I would have paid for them, you know? Um, they also bought their debt, but that's... Yeah, their, their, their pension um, is, is quite something, as I discovered. I actually did go down that road. But but I, I share that because I've always looked at institutions um, with actually a desire to reinvent. That's why I worked in mainstream media. And I mm -hmm. think something shifted in the moment when everybody seemed ready, right? Like seemed ready in terms of, yeah, we got to diversify our newsrooms. We need to talk to sources that are not the same five people everybody else is calling. We need to produce content that centers the people who we are writing about as opposed to writing for politicians and journalists and pretending we're writing for these other communities. But guess what? They don't really read the Washington Post or the New York Times, right? And so it just came to a point where I felt like bringing other people along, I could spend the rest of my life doing that. And it really dawned on me, you know, I just turned 45, you know, I, I always say this, that life is short and careers are long. <laughs> and that latter piece of it, you know, bringing people along is exhausting. And I've been doing it for more than 20 years. And I have, I am really proud of what I built. And I still need mainstream media today. I work with some, you know, some big brands. I write a column for Time Magazine. Like, we need the mainstream media to be a part of this. So I did not leave and say, okay, well, good luck to all of you. I do this in partnership. On the other hand, I had a lot of hunches that I felt like I could test very quickly. I could um, innovate in a way that was kind of the marriage of, you know, I'm really lucky, Mary Ellen, you and I have this foundation from when newsrooms, you know, you had a few reporters to an editor. So somebody took the time with your copy, mm -hmm. you learned management lessons. It wasn't like a situation I found myself in years later in my career. I was one editor with 22 reporters. Right. That's crazy. And so I came of age in this weird time in journalism because it was definitely contracting and shrinking in newspapers. But I learned the foundation really well. And you got to learn the foundation in order to rip it apart. Right. Like I really feel like, you know, inverted pyramid style and narrative journalism and long form like I could go head to head with a lot of people. And that is precisely why I just rip it down and I'm like, let's do the listicle, right? Like, let's just, you know what? I'm so confident in what this guy said. Like, I think we should just quote these six people and like, that's our story. Um, so I have a lot of conviction in the foundation of my journalism that allows me to be freed of it in many ways. And I think mm -hmm. that confidence is really important when you're going to not just be an entrepreneur, but when you're going out there with your content, right? This is something that'll be familiar with a lot of your um, audience. Mm -hmm. um, I think swagger and ego is a little bit of it. Like I have a belief mm -hmm. in myself and I am at a stage in my career, I probably wasn't there 10 years ago, where I think I could give this a go. I have some theses about um, the way we should serve content to audiences. I think we could also 
Like, I think it's okay for some journalism to be produced for journalists and policymakers with hopes of effecting change. I think if that's the core of your journalism, that's problematic. The core of my journalism is truly people and a belief that in some ways the answers are among us as opposed to um, being talked at or about. Um, so these were sort of like the ideas that I said, I just haven't been able to test these because that's not how inverted pyramid works. It's not how legacy media that I've ever worked in mm -hmm. has worked. Um, that's not to say I'm, I'm a revolutionary in this. There are outlets, you know, some of them are in the URL media network, documented comes to mind. They, they communicate with their readers via WhatsApp and text messaging. So I take a lot of- <laughs> Yeah. I mean, actually, I do like technology too. I try try to like embrace technology and try different things. I we actually talked about that this morning. I mean, the opening. Tom and I were talking about if you started off and you were in the media business, if you were doing the same thing that you were doing like ten years ago, five years ago, three years ago, shit. If it was the same thing you were doing six months ago, like you're dead. Yeah. Like you're like this is yeah. not. <laughs> like, it's so true. I mean, I feel that way in the year. Like we grew from a dinky mm -hmm. newsletter. Now we have live streams, podcasts. We are texting people. We have a fleet of volunteers that are giving people information. I mean, we're trying so many different things. Um, and for us to have stayed a newsletter, you know, there's this there's this mantra of kind of like stay in your lane and do one thing right. And I'm like, except that the Internet is changing every five mm -hmm. minutes. Right. So I totally I think that's a really important point. I think it's about mission. I think mission stays the same and channels can change. And in fact, channels should change like as fast as you can, like as fast as like your audience needs them to. Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, we yeah. go where they go. Yeah. I think that yeah. we, we go where they go. And then we're also trying to find what's the consistent thing we can be to people. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's so interesting to talk to other digital leaders because they'll often say, but it's hard to get digital newsrooms to leave behind the thing that they launched with, right? So mm -hmm. it's like we've become the legacy uh, offenders in some way. So. <laughs> well, people don't like change, which actually kind of kind of brings us to this. It's like, when, okay, so you've also led people through a lot of changes, right? I would say you're very collaborative. We talked about you bringing people up. You think about this project you've got now. It, it is not a well, Mitra says this is what it's going to be like, so this is what we're going to do kind of initiative. You've got a, a partner, and I'd like to even talk a little bit about that in a moment. But, like, how do you prepare yourself for change, I say part one? And part two, how do you, in a way that you lead, like, prepare the others, like, that you're working with and, like, make change safe? Like, what? what talk to me about your philosophy about change. Change management's a terrible term, but, like, no, how do you lead for change? I mean, I think there's data which I'm immersed in uh, pretty regularly. And like the minute I switched to digital, which my conversion came when I left the Wall Street Journal and went to courts, and I mm -hmm. just like, made it my business to study Chartbeat and our analytics and see what was mm -hmm. trending. Um, so some of it is just truly like, what is the data telling us in terms of consumption? The other is to really lean into instinct. And like, you know, I think about this where my landscape of instinct is you know, the walk to the subway every day, the birthday parties that I roll my eyes at, but I still go with my kids to on the weekends or, um, you know, watching how they consume media. So there's a lot of those two things that inform, um, you know, this idea. I just, I just did a, um, a piece for time on Indra Nui's book. She's the former CEO of PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. And she calls it kind of the ability to peer around corners and I think that's a really good analogy because you're you're rooted in expertise and data, but you're also listening to what's about to become the data, which journalists are actually, I hope, good at this. Because you're on, I mean, if you're a good journalist, you unlearn the world every day and kind of try to absorb it anew. So I, I, that's like one way that I've tried to stay ahead. In terms of bringing people along, that's harder. Um, there's two things that I've relied on. One is... Um, uh, you know, I get, I got to a place where I would sort of say before a difficult or blunt conversation, like I would look in the mirror and be like, I am a good person. <laughs> and I just need to like cling to, I am a good person as I tell you what I'm about to tell you. So some of that <laughs> is, um, you know, you can't, you gotta be who you are in delivering right. feedback and, and bluntness, but people seem to actually value that once they know you're not BSing them. The second is um, to realize that when you 
are the change agent, especially in a large newsroom, although I would say it's even in my current newsroom, there needs to be place for different personality types at all steps of the way. And Mm -hmm. we often look for people like us. And actually to Mm -hmm. effect change, you got to look for the, in some ways, not necessarily the resistant to change, because that's like an obstacle, but who are the stabilizing influences in your newsroom who get work done every day, right? Who are the day in, day out, like, you know, I turn to this guy and he gets it done, or I turn to this woman and she gets it done. And I started there. And that's really helped me. And then the last thing I'll say is in this time of rapid growth for both URL and Epicenter, I didn't expect both businesses to take off like they did, but they've taken Mm -hmm. off. And guess what happens? You know, like our lead newsletter writer was hired to write a newsletter. She was not hired to do a podcast, a live stream, to run a multimedia company where like suddenly I'm like more, 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 you know, and um, Mm -hmm. By the way, like we need to learn ad ops too, which is really complex. (laughs) Right. But in my messaging, there is we will bring you along, but also when there is growth, there is room for you. And that has been like a real recent um, insight and kind of leading from a place of much greater generosity. Some of it is inspired by burnout. Some of it is inspired by really feeling like we've wronged our workforce by treating people as disposable when we move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. What I, you know, to, to the originals who took a leap of faith to just be like, yeah, this dinky queen's newsletter called Epicenter sounds great. You know, um, they took a leap of faith and when we're growing is precisely the time that there's more room for everybody. And so when you're trying to run an inclusive company that is inclusive in its content and inclusive in its outlook and what it means to community, there has to be a meta layer of how you're leading. Um, And I've really over the last six months just tried to internalize that so that our team meetings create a place of comfort and that same confidence that allowed me to make the leap is something I really need to make sure that everyone on our team has. It's interesting you said that because I think that you're countering something. Most people assume that growth means I might get left behind. And I do think that that's the model that we've we've used. I mean, this is something I've seen quite a bit actually in the human capital management sort of work that we do, the companies we work with, is people are starting to shift toward like, if the skills expire so quickly, if the business strategy has to change so quickly, like what is eternal? Yeah. And like what you were just describing to me, those are your values. Mm-hmm. Like the mission didn't change. Your values didn't change. Just the channel, like <laughs> you know, like, yeah. yeah, I feel like, I feel like that's kind of, that's what I'm hearing here. And it's like, I, right. I, and I don't people know. People will say that. I can't do that. Like I, I want to be honest about the hard conversations within what mm-hmm. I just said, because it can mm-hmm. sound really come by up. The hard conversations within are somebody saying, but I don't know how to do this, right? And the response Mm -hmm. to that is, we will help you learn. And Mm -hmm. some of it, it's also, you can't be a insert, you know, journalist, community manager, um, SEO analyst, I mean, insert any (laughs) job description and not care about, and usually it comes down to some way of reaching our audience, right? Because we're mm-hmm. so audience centric. So so I really try to, to your point, just bring it back to the mission, but kind of break down where is the hurdle and let's address that because, you know, your career will stagnate if we don't do this thing. So we might as, we might as well help get you there, you know? All right, y'all, we have one minute left here. Real quick, if anybody has questions for Amitra, um, I I mean, I have another question that I'll ask if nobody does. You got a second here. Um, What's next? Tell me what you're doing. I see, you you know, you and Sarah, you're partnering, that's your partner in URL Media. You've got Epicenter going. What is next for you, like in 2022? So 2022 for Epicenter, we're dealing with um, this historic sea change of we're about to have our second African-American mayor of New York City. This is, Our city council has never had this many women. It's about to be the most diverse city council, um, the first South Asian city council member. We might even have three of them, if you can believe it. Um, so really, I never positioned Epicenter as a political product. My big challenge for 2022 is how do you cover what I just laid out from mm-hmm. the ground up? And that, to me, is this puzzle 
I welcome all thoughts on it. I welcome questions on that. <laughs> For URL Media, it's um, the expansion of the network and continuing to really lean into this advertising network that we um, really believe that the power of niche but scale is um, is re like that I'll take like I think is revolutionary mm -hmm. and my hope is that in 2022 I can come to you and say we've you know grown the network by x percentage a large percentage um and that we I would say by the end of 22 if you feel like we are the read where you have to start with us because we're presenting the news that's going to be in other outlets in six weeks, then I feel from a content perspective, I've been successful. And as I mentioned, the ad network is like priority, priority, priority right now. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank like we are, we're, we're actually over time. I'm okay. sure Tom is the person over well. there. But yeah, yeah. Up next, we got Stephanie Esqueda. She's the uh, content, events content manager at Coindesk. And she's going to be talking about how she gets 10,000 people to show up to cryptocurrency conferences. So should be interesting stuff. So, all right. Thanks, y'all.